Okay, so I want to run through notes I took from Lincoln Riley's press conference, takeaways, all that good stuff after the bumper. What do you mean oh. you don't subscribe to my son's YouTube channel? Mama, no! Just snap the damn ball, RJ! What's up, kinfolk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. So it's always related, college football related, sports related. We have a good time. And today, I want to talk about takeaways, notes I took on Lincoln Riley's press conference ahead of its game or his game against South Dakota on Saturday. South Dakota is an FCS opponent. He had some things to say about that, but let's, let's get to the notes. His two most disappointing takeaways, parts from OU Houston, are the penalties and the lack of focus late up big. Now, penalties, talking about like unsportsmanlike conduct penalties and a couple pass interference penalties, but they were the good kind, and he talked a little bit more about that later. But the lack of focus, I think, is something that really needs to be hammered on because that's actually something you can fix, and that does come down to what's going on in between your ears when you see your team is up by a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to equate this to basketball for just a second because I remember – beat writer. I'm covering the men's basketball team early on and they didn't take a lot of wins in those first couple of years when Lon Kruger was coaching and they got on a bit of a streak and they felt good about themselves at nine con and Stephen Pledger decided to throw up a left-handed runner at practice and he got chastised for it by Kruger who I think put his finger on it just like Lincoln Riley did at the presser. You have to stay focused. You can't get too far ahead of yourself. You can't get too up or too down and you can't lose your composure because yes, you won the game, and you won the game by two touchdowns, but you could have won the game by even more if you just kept your focus and tried to go make a play as opposed to a few missed tackles that he actually, that's the next takeaway, he didn't feel that bad about. He said that there weren't nearly as many missed tackles as many of us thought there were, particularly on one drive where it felt like nobody could tackle anybody. But I think he's right, especially coming off of week one when nobody tackles anymore. And as much as we want to harp on, do we teach the kids to tackle? Yeah, in theory. But they don't really take anybody to the ground. They don't wrap up like that. They don't declete anybody because you want people healthy to play the game. And that means that you're going to miss more tackles than you should in the first couple of weeks because you just don't have those game day reps. It's actually going to be really interesting to see how all this plays out in the next few years because people are tackling less. And since people are tackling less, you're going to see even more missed tackles, which also brings into question just how good do we expect people to be at tackling in the game of football. Just food for thought. Next takeaway. Uh, yes, South, South Dakota is the game on the schedule. A lot of folks don't want to see South Dakota on the schedule. But he was saying, look, I don't get to change who's on the schedule. I don't get to change how good or bad they were because if they were as good as North Dakota State or South Dakota State, you probably wouldn't be this pissed about it. Actually, probably even be more pissed about it because why would you schedule a powerhouse FCS school? You have nothing to gain there and everything to lose. At least this way, South Dakota is coming off of a 4-7 and seven season, and they got beat 31-17 by Montana to open their season at home in Vermilion. They're not going to be great, but you need to treat them with the same respect and discipline that you would any other team, especially since, and this nails it, you only get a dozen of these. And each one of them needs to be cherished because we are going to rehash and rehash and rehash this game over and over and over, just like we rehash all the games. And let this one be close, and you could end up like Iowa State. Coach's poll dropped while the press conference was going on with Lincoln Riley. Iowa State was dropped out of the coach's poll after a three-overtime win against Northern Iowa, but they kept Nebraska at 25. They kicked Boise State up into the top 25 for the way they beat Florida State. I just think that it's wrong to penalize a team who got a win. And I'm having a hard time taking the coach's poll seriously because they're ranking Nebraska after they've shown little to nothing. They needed to actually play football to beat South Alabama, like good football, by their standards. Oh, man, I keep going on about that, but I won't. K-9 was solid, and the defense around him was also solid. Riley refused to just gush about Kenneth Murray Jr. in the way that he played, having 13 tackles and one and a half for loss against Houston. We all thought he was superlative and great on the defense, but he was saying, look, he got a lot of help. Defensive line kept him clean. The secondary stayed with their guys and were able to help him make plays in the run game, help him actually be able to do that thing where he just chases down people. Kind of think about that in the way that everything works together. And when things are working together, you're going to see Kenneth Murray Jr. coming downhill one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with a running back, back, with a quarterback, with a tight end, with whomever, and be able to make a play. Solid take. Well, okay, it's Eric Swenson and R.J. Proctor. 
will continue to flip at tackle, left tackle. You saw that Eric Swenson was listed as a starter. Game time decision meant R.J. Proctor was the starter at left tackle. They flip-flopped. And Riley said, yeah, we played 26 guys on the defense, but we played just six guys on the offensive line because we're still working out what we want to do with R.J. Proctor and Eric Swenson. Also means that you feel really good about your guard situation. There's depth there. That's the subplot. But Swenson was banged up a little bit in camp. R.J. Proctor just got more reps and also showed that he could play the position. And if you're going to leave it up to Beatenbow, he's probably going to play the guy that's got more seasoning. That's just what he's done. He's shown that he wants to play guys that are older, that have been around longer, even if they're guys like R.J. Proctor. But Eric Swenson apparently has shown enough during camp to where he had earned the job if he was just healthy and he's full go now. Shouldn't be any worries about that. Now they're just going to let those guys compete to see who wins the job permanently. T.J. Pledger is expected back this season. That's big. He had the thumb injury. Post about it on Instagram. Know that many of you watched that upload. They're not going to have him in the immediate future, but they do expect him back in the future this season. That's also big. Jalen doesn't really care about the national attention at all. Could care less. That is not put on. I've made the joke that he is Sphinx from Mystery Men, where everything is just circle back to itself. If you doubt your power, you give power to your doubt. That kind of stuff. And Lincoln swore that the kid comes, you know, alive and he jokes and he has a good time. But yes, he is all business. He's here to do a job. His focus is on getting better. And that was also really interesting to hear Lincoln say is, as much as we're like, yeah, do you see the yardage that he put up? Do you see the records that he broke? Do you see how efficiently he ran the offense? Both Jalen Hurts and Lincoln Riley swear up and down there are, there's just a gaping hole for improvement for Jalen Hurts. I'm excited, really excited to see what that might look like because the gaping hole is still can you complete passes deep down the left side of the field. And you haven't yet. Maybe that changes. Okay, on the national attention to the team, as opposed to just Jalen Hurts, he said, we teach them if it's bad coming from within our building, worry. If it ain't coming from within our building, don't worry. Another way of saying, listen to what we tell you and not to what anybody else tells you. All right, which is also, I thought was smart, him just tacitly acknowledging they're going to see what we say. They're going to see what we write. There are kiddos that listen to the podcast and use it as motivation. There are kiddos that listen to the podcast and say, yo, that was very cool. Whatever happens, you're the guy playing the game. I understand that. But it also, I'm going to react to it because that's my job. Lincoln has said, look, it ain't sexy to say that the way to gain, win games and the way to be consistent is to be boring and to know that every game you have to get better and continue to make steps to get better. But it also shows that the formula has worked for them to get into the college football playoff and it's worked for them to win Big 12 championships. Has it worked for you to win a college football playoff semifinal? Now, there's your bulletin more material. Go on. Riley was adamant that Jalen can play better. Expectations are so much higher. Said that needs to find middle ground on Jalen Hurts' running style. Yes. So we're going to do the thing where we fret about how often Jalen Hurts is running and where he's running to and how he gets down on the ground. Did that with Kyler. Didn't do it as much with Baker, though he did take off. Nobody wants to see a quarterback running all the time because the likelihood of him getting hurt goes through the roof. And you got to know that when you get the first down, probably get down or get to the sideline, whatever it is, because we need you back there calling plays and making plays. And you can't do that if you're concussion protocol or you blow a knee. They've talked about it, especially after the game when he did have 16 carries for 176 yards with three TDs, but there's only so much you can change, and Riley admits that. It's just the balancing act between him and Hurts, and Hurts understanding, hey, man, yeah, when you need to run, go run, but when you know that it's dangerous, get down. And I think Nobody understands that more than Jalen Hurts. On the unsportsmanlike conduct penalties from Nick Basquin blocking a player out of bounds and, of course, Pat Fields picking up a late hit, he was saying, look, I don't really get that mean or pissy about penalties that happen in that manner because they kind of happen within the pace of the game. A guy is trying to do his job and he's getting after it. And he said the quote was, that dog got a bite. Because if that dog doesn't bite and you play clean and there are no penalties and you look up, scoreboard ain't going to be pretty. You got to have a guy that's got to have some edge to him, got some stuff in his neck that wants to go out there and play a little football to win. And I think that's the right take too. Now we got, oh yeah, he'd love to, he, he'd love to do more Sunday games. I'll bet he would because our Sunday games or Sunday games like the one that they played against Houston where they're the only game in town. They're the only football game anybody's watching. 
and you got a lot of recruits on because this is the only game they can go to and the added value of being able to one play at night which means you can get more guys on campus because they can't make 11 a.m kickoffs and they get to get back in time for practice on monday because it was labor day worked out perfectly unless it didn't because it can go badly right if houston would have pulled off an upset that's not a good look for you it's not a good look for your program and that kind of sort of happened when ohio state came to norman and they got embarrassed got some of the kids that were there but Obviously, people take a lot away from those primetime games because not everybody is watching OU football all the time, every time. Not everybody cares that much or will care that much or should care that much. But when you have their attention, you have to maximize it and get value out of it. And I think they did that. Just see the earlier upload to this one. Ronnie Perkins stood out as a guy who was doing the best on the defensive line to Riley. I think that's a solid take as well. You got good stuff out of Neville Gallimore. You got good stuff out of, of course, Jalen Hurts when he was on the field. He also added that Dylan Fawmatow could have gone. They just decided not to because it wasn't worth it. And Kenneth Mann is not all the way back, and he couldn't have played Saturday or Sunday, but they expect him to be back in a couple of days, in a matter of days. It could be South Dakota, but I doubt it because that game just doesn't. You shouldn't need Kenneth Mann to play against South Dakota, just like you shouldn't need Dylan Fawmatow to play against South Dakota. You would actually need them more against Houston for obvious reasons. He took a shot at uh, the Drownia or the Crownia, meaning the national attention and people that are going to instantly react to how you play the game. One, that's the job. That's my job. That's what I do. That's what fans do. That's how we do this stuff because there's so many games in, or days in between. But you'd also be very upset if we didn't pay as much attention to you as we do. You can't have it both ways. And I think he understands that because you want all this attention on you and you want people to talk about recruits and you want people to talk about recruiting when it's in your best interest. When you don't play well, it's not so much fun. And I get that where you need to be as a coach, as a player, is turn this off. Don't watch this. Don't watch first take. Don't listen to the radio. Keep your head in the sand if that's what you do. Or go on about your business and be an adult because that's what it is. Some folks are out here just saying stuff. Some folks are actually putting in some thought. I take notes. I say what I mean. I back it up. I'm trying to do a really good job. I think most people are just trying to get a better understanding of how this team works and why it works. And since Oklahoma is not enthusiastic about being that open about what they're doing or why they're doing it, because that's the nature of football and football teams. I mean, the Patriots aren't open about what they're doing or why they're doing it. You see it on film. And then you get what you get out of Belichick or what you get out of Brady, but they don't say a whole lot. I get that's how folks operate, but I also think the drown your crown you stuff is a little bit overblown because people understand nuance and people are not idiots. Jalen Hurts is a sphinx. I said that already. Comes back to acknowledge. Yep, he did acknowledge that. Brian Odom has made a big impression in the short amount of time he's been here. Lincoln Riley's quote was, he's an outstanding young coach. I think that's all coming through. He played here so he understands what it means to be a player at Oklahoma. He's obviously got a background in strength conditioning that helps him out. He coached at the SEC at Mizzou. He was also on Grinch's staff at Washington State. We know all about Brian Odom. Kenneth Murray Jr. believes he's the best linebackers coach in the nation, which is what you expect one of his linebackers to say, but it all bear out in the wash. I do think that Odom has done a remarkable job in the short amount he has been here. I think that's on the, on the nose. I think he's going to help tremendously with keeping kids in state, and I also think that he's going to have a really big role in getting this defense back to where people wanted to go. Brian Odom, stinky good hire. Short week is condensed with planning periods and recovery periods so as you know Oklahoma played a game on Sunday and they're playing a game on Saturday what does that mean for players and coaches well for coaches Riley admittedly said hey I'm not sleeping as much we're not sleeping as much also means that they got to be really creative with the recovery period for the players because usually from game night to game prep week you got a day off, right? They usually take Sunday off and then they get the kids back in there on Monday. They were out on Monday practicing and they're having to really schedule in how they're going to do the recovery period for the kids because that's most important. And Benny Wiley, I'm sure, has already thought about that from the moment they ended the season last year and he's already putting them through routine to help them get back to good for South Dakota and what that means later on in the season. But I thought the most interesting thing that he said out of all of that was – in the didn't have in the true day off that that's really what you're working against you're working against a 24-hour period that you would like to have back Rambo was superlative we knew this three catches 105 yards 56 yard touchdown one that he had a whole lot of yak for 
Riley mentioned we always want to have a guy on our roster with elite speed like Marquise Brown before him, D.D. Westbrook, Jeff Bidette, guys like that. Rambo is obviously of that ilk, cut from that same cloth. I thought it was interesting that he said, I should have played Rambo more in the Orange Bowl, knowing that Marquise Brown was not 100% and did not look himself. And he says that was one of my biggest regrets is not playing Rambo more because Obviously, when he got out there, he was able to do some good things against Alabama, and you really can count on one hand how many people did a good thing against Alabama. Last note, Shane Beamer was listed on the injury report. I thought that was funny. They made a video making fun of him because he headbutted Jeremiah Hall after Jeremiah Hall scored a TD, had the first TD of the season, was very excited, didn't have a helmet on when he he headbutted a guy with a helmet on. Riley said, hey, if you're going to come here, you got to have some thick skin. That's how it's going to go. We're going to make fun of you, do something like that, but Shane Beamer is an outstanding young coach, great offensive assistant. I enjoy hearing Shane Beamer speak. I don't get to say that a lot about a lot of coaches, but he is articulate. He's meaningful. He's thoughtful. Kind of like Riley. I think Riley's kind of getting edgy just just a little bit. Just a little bit. You can tell if you've been listening to him talking these press conferences as a head coach for a length of time, but not enough for anybody who doesn't listen to him on a regular basis to notice. Beamer seems to just understand how all this works, and he wants to be good at it. And I appreciate that because I think that dude has head coach aspirations. Matter of fact, he might be the first head coach out of this staff, even ahead of Grinch, just because of his background. And I've done that upload, and I could do that again. But today, I just want to do the takeaways from the presser. All right, that is it for me. This is